Hi, it's Greg Carroll here with another screencast. And tonight I want to share a trick with you for augmenting the behavior of, of existing commands. Um, and in short, that trick is that you define a function which has the same name as the command. Um, and then depending on the arguments that are passed to you, you either call the command in a certain way or you do something else. Um, but the idea is that the user of the, of the command shouldn't notice that you're going through this layer of indirection. Um, so this is a technique which you probably wouldn't want to abuse too much, but I do use it for a few little things. Um, and just to give you one example, um, I have a wrapper for the git command. So when I run a git command, it looks like I'm running git, but what's actually happening is I'm calling a shell function. Um, and the reason why I do this um, is because I wanted to implement a git root subcommand, uh, which would operate like this. So just say I go down to some, I don't even know where I'm going. <laughs> Let's go to say, I'm just randomly picking a directory. Just say I'm deep down in the directory of a repo um, and I want to go to the top level. I can type git root um, and jump there. Um, or I could run a command from the root of the repo. So just say I wanted to do git root ls, it's going to be as though I'd run ls at the root of the repo, but I'm still in a subdirectory of the repo. Um, so this is done as a function um, and not as a normal alias because aliases run in the context. Well, let me show you what aliases run in. So I'm going to list out my aliases. So these are all the aliases that I have defined for git. These are not shell aliases. Um, and as you can see here, um, if we go to the top there, we've got ones like this one, which is a brev. So what does a brev do? Um, well, the bang there means it's going to actually shell out to run another command. And I'll show you what it does. If I run git a brev, it's going to show me that I'm not in a git repo. Uh, it's going to show me an abbreviated hash of the commit. But uh, the fact that it's, oops, where is it? The fact that it's a shell function here means that I can uh, actually take a parameter. So for example, if um, this, what this says here is that if I don't pass a, uh, a parameter, then just use head and show me the abbreviation of the head. Otherwise, show me the abbrevi abbreviation for the, uh, the thing that I passed. So for example, just say I want to know the abbreviation for the next branch. That's how that would work. Um, the other kind of git aliases that you might have are ones like this. They don't start with a bang. Um, and all they do is just call an existing git command. So for example, if I type git ack something, um, it prints results that are similar to what ack would print. So for example, I print ack fig. Um, in other words, you know, headings and line numbers. Um, and it is as though I had typed git grep break, uh, what is it, heading and then fig. All right, so that's another kind of alias. Um, and then yet another kind of alias is the one where you define a function in line. So um, if we go up here, oops, if we go up here again, uh, this is an example here, this one here. Um, that you see there, bang, so we're in shell land again. We define function f and we call it. Now in practice, um, defining a function and then calling it, oops, and just starting a new shell like we have done here, ends up being pretty similar because you can pass arguments to both. Um, and to be honest, I don't really have any rhyme or reason for why I do it one, one way or the other. These aliases are things that I've built up over years. As you can see, I've got 33 of them and I wrote them at different times. Now, the reason why we need to define git as a function is because there is some category of things that you can't do like that git root thing that I showed you. Um, so let me jump back into a place again, aspects. Well, this is a nice deep one. Let's go down there. Um, so you see I'm pretty deep down into the repo structure there. Now, I can't do this as a git alias because uh, the only thing I can do from a git alias, as we've just seen, is call another git command or do something in a subshell. So if I want to cd to the root of the repo, I could certainly do that in an alias, but as soon as the subshell exits, I would be exactly where I started. So it wouldn't actually work. And so uh, that means that you can't write a git root kind of thing uh, as an alias. Uh, and so for a long time, what I did was I had an alias, uh, a shell alias. So if we look at that, let's search for alias. So these are my, no, these are not my shell aliases. I thought set would show me aliases. Does alias show my aliases? Yes, it does. Um, so let me just close this top one. So these are my shell aliases. Um, and so for a long time, I had a G root alias that basically moved me to the root of the, the Git repo. Um, and so I would, you know, I'd be down in a subdirectory like this. I'd go g root, and this kind of really annoyed me. The fact that all my other aliases were git space something. So, for example, I have um, I've you know git patch, which allows me to 
Uh, it's basically calling git add dash p so that I can stage hunks into the staging area or the index. Um, all my other aliases are like that, git space something. Um, so the fact that I couldn't do git space root really annoyed me. Um, so what I did instead was, well, let's go to the root just to prove that it works. <laughs> what I did instead was make this wrapper function, which I'm now finally, after all of that talking, going to show you. So it's in Z functions. I've got to, well, actually, I'll just run through a few of these. Um, here's the first one. AG, which I can't even remember what that is. What is that? Is that the silver searcher? Uh, that's a wrapper for AG. And as this comment here suggests, um, there's no dot file that you can use to set up defaults for AG. So a use case here is, well, just overwrite it with a function. That is the same name and applies some default parameters to your invocations of AG. Um, and the way it works is um, when you have AG defined as a function, that will be used preferentially before anything in your path. But then here on line seven, we use command to say, run the actual command AG, don't run the function. So that's how this avoids being a recursive call that ends up calling itself endlessly and going into an infinite loop. So AG is one. Um, I don't actually use AG anymore. I kind of went from grep to ack to ag and now to rip grep and there's more stuff, but I just can't be bothered <laughs> going to the next one. Um, so most of these are just normal functions, but here's the git one that I wanted to show you. Um, so basically, what does this function wrapper do? It's the same basic trick. It's called git, so it's going to be called whenever I type git instead of the function git, instead of the command git. Um, and then eventually, depending on a couple of things, it's going to wind up calling command git, which means run the binary executable. I mean, as you can see here, um, the test is if the first argument to this function is the word root, then pop that argument off the list of arguments, figure out what the root is, um, which in this case is done by calling git rev pass dash dash show top level. Um, and the, the two there means what, whatever errors are produced while running this command should be uh, redirected to dev null. So anything on standard error just gets swallowed. Um, if this command fails, the or or here is gonna, is gonna kick in. Why can't I jump there? Or, or um, and it's just gonna echo dot. So in other words, it'll either print the root of the repo that we're in, or it'll just print a dot for the current directory, um, which means it always does at least something gracefully. Um, so at that point, if there are no arguments left, then we just CD to the root. Um, otherwise, if there are arguments, uh, we CD to the root and we eval those arguments. So that's what I was doing before when I did get root ls, right? Um, and you'll notice the parentheses here, uh, those are a subshell, which means the CD only has effect for the duration of the command, which is how I was able to run get root ls and stay where I was. Now, if none of that is true, then we hit this else branch and we're just gonna run git. Um, and the dollars at here uh, basically expands it. It's as though all of the arguments that I'd passed um, were forwarded to git. Um, the difference between at and star, which I always have to look up, is that dollars star puts everything in a single argument. So just say I just say I ran, you know, git foo bar baz. Um, if my alias and if my function ends up calling git dollars star, then it is though I had passed foo bar baz to git. Um, but what I actually had here was at, which is which is effectively like saying git foo bar baz. Okay, so that's what that's basically what we want here because it, it means all of those other commands that I invoke Git with should continue to behave as they always have. Um, so I won't give any more demos of that because everyone knows how Git works. So let's keep going here through my list of functions. Uh, we've got history, scratch, SSH. This is an example of another command that's wrapped. Most of the time uh, you just use it blindly as SSH and it works as you'd expect. But behind the scenes, it's doing this thing where it's making sure that the term in variable is it, the term environment variable is massaged a little bit before calling the SSH process. And as you can see here, what it's doing is um, substituting the word tmux for screen because a lot of hosts that you connect to don't have term, term info database settings for uh, tmux. So just, it's just a little bit of graceful degradation on those systems. Uh, what else do I have here? tmux, um, I think I might have actually talked about this one in another, another screencast. Uh, what this does is for the, well, first of all, it does this, Thing that um, makes sure that any SSH agent that you've got running outside of Tmux is visible to shells that are launched inside it, um, which is convenient. Um, and the other thing it does is it looks for a .tmux file, uh, which is basically just a list of commands because Tmux is very scriptable. And in fact, I can show you an example of one here. Um, basically, this is what they look like. They're just shell script, right? 
um, and uh, tmux. Basically, this says if you've already got a session in this directory, then you'll open that session and attach to it. Otherwise, you'll create one with some splits, right? Um, so I have a few repos where I have these little .tmux files. It's kind of like tmux, tmuxinator without having a dependency. Um, so basically, that's what that wrapper does. And I don't think I've got any more wrappers. The rest are just shell functions. Yep, I'd say that's it. Um, so that's the basic idea. I know I was racing a little bit there, uh, but I can't be bothered going any slower. So hopefully it at least plants the, the seed of the idea in your mind that you can employ this trick to augment the behavior of existing commands uh, in a transparent and subtle way uh, without uh, too much difficulty. Uh, so that's all I got for now. I uh, hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you next time.